Let's bring in Vivek Ramaswamy, biotech entrepreneur and Republican presidential candidate. Vivek, I lived in San Francisco about 23 years ago. It's been a long slide into filth and violence and assault and thievery and murder. And I'll stand up and say, if the liberals continue to rule this country, the whole nation will look like San Francisco and New York City. This is very sad to see. And in the name of protecting black communities and the kinds of communities that were supposedly protected by depolicing, they've actually made the country less safe for everyone, including those black communities. I think it's really clear evidence. You want to actually bring down the crime rate in cities like New York and San Francisco. The number one variable is the arrest rate. And guess what they have done? They have actually effectively decriminalized the kinds of things that would have previously resulted in arrests. Turns out the criminals, like all people, respond to the incentives they're given. If they know they're less likely to be arrested, they're more likely to commit those crimes. And I'm sorry to say that the result we're seeing, and this is a really sad story, if something positive comes out of it, let it be a catalyst for change. If there's one principle, it's the fact that policymakers got us the disaster. Policymakers, it's now up to them to lead us out of it in cities across this country. But, but, but Vivek, those policymakers were voted in by the electorate. And I have to imagine a, a guy running for president like yourself, who, by the way, I agree with a lot of what you say on how we fix the ailments of this country. But you have, whether it's San Francisco, New York, we just had a new mayor elected in Chicago where crime is rampant that is not going to do anything about crime. So the voters keep voting for the crazy policy, not for the kind of common sense policies that you talk about. Because of the partisan channels through which voters have been tricked into voting for one party, the Democratic Party, they're actually getting more of the same. Now, I think that's changing. I think that is likely to change in the months and years ahead as this crime problem becomes worse in places like Chicago, San Francisco, and New York. I also think there can be a role for the federal government to play here, though. This is a public safety issue. And as the next president, I'm going to take a very careful look at states and cities that are getting federal aid that should not be getting aid because they're not living up to their own standards. This can't be a two-way relationship where the federal government simply showers money like from on high, like mana from heaven, effectively rewarding these kinds of bad behaviors. And so if, it, if the change is going to be too slow bottom up, I think there's a role for the federal government here to actually discipline the states and cities that are the recipients of federal funds in ways that actually are incentivizing these cities to keep their streets less safe. I refuse to stand by as a bystander and let that happen in this country. Well, we brought this up yesterday with Chicago, the four major pensions in Chicago are wild underfunded and rather than let Chicago go bankrupt which is where it's headed you know that the state of Illinois is going to call on the US taxpayer for a bailout that's what end up ends up happening in addition to all the money that is funneled into say the schools which is then commandeered by the teachers unions Exactly. I mean, those are two parallel examples of how federal funding is misused, actually. Right now, if that happens again, I'll tell you what, that's a condition for a catalyst to say that unless this city changes, they're not going to see a dime of federal dollars coming their way. That's how you deliver accountability. And you want to talk about in the schools, that's the problem with the U.S. Department of Education, which actually uses its money as a cudgel, as a sort of handcuff to get local schools to adopt these toxic agendas. That's a big part of the reason why I've pledged as U.S. president that I will shut down the U.S. Department of Education, which should have never existed, not because I'm anti-education, but because I am pro-education, and yet the federal government's funds are being used to actually even worsen the way local schools are going about their work. So I think that's actually the role for the U.S. president to lead the way next time around. And we should look at the commie camps, which are universities that teach our kids to be communists, not American-loving, constitutional-loving Americans. That would be a good start as well. But I want to pivot to you because I want to talk about Alvin mm -hmm. Bragg, the Manhattan DA, Tonight, he's responding to a subpoena from House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan in the Trump hush money investigation. Bragg writing, quote, repeated efforts to weaken state and local law enforcement actions are an abuse of power and will not deter us from our duty to uphold the law. Vivek, an abuse of power. Bragg is abusing his power to try to impact the 2024 election. 
So, look, I say this as somebody who's running against yeah. Donald Trump. This is obviously a politicized prosecution. It is a persecution. And there's two things about this legally that are worth observing. I made an argument in today's Wall Street Journal about this. OK, mm -hmm. the first is they actually say that this is an alleged campaign finance violation because Trump should have used campaign fund money rather than personal money. And it was a constructive campaign contribution that actually messes the law up. If anything, if Trump had used campaign finance money to settle a personal hush money issue due to an alleged defense, Fair, that would have been a campaign finance violation. So if you're going to get it one way or another, that shows that it's actually politicized all the way down. Now, I've also made the case that since this is a federal crime, that's eligible for a pardon. I think that just like so many politicized prosecution and victims of politicized prosecutions in the last few years deserve to be pardoned, President Trump makes that list too. And I've said that as U.S. president, I would do it. But the deeper issue is Alvin Bragg, is his competence is not to enforce a federal campaign finance law, which is what he's supposed to do here. What he's supposed to be doing is taking those violent criminals on the streets of New York yes. and putting them in prison instead. Instead, he's actually lost the plot for instead going after an arcane legal theory, prosecuting effective of an alleged federal campaign finance violation. That's a perversion of justice. Deserve to call it out. Before we move on, to, uh, there are a couple other things we want to talk to you about. But uh, there was a CNN poll that came out this afternoon that said that only a third, it's actually a less, it's less than a third, but roughly one third of Americans say Biden deserves to be reelected in 2024. He's delayed his announcement uh, his campaign announcement. But some liberal I know boldly told me, looked me in the face and said, no Republican will ever get elected again to the White House because of guns, school shootings and abortion. I strongly disagree with that. I think people of this country care about our missing national identity. We used to be bound by a common set of ideals that gave us the prosperity we enjoyed in this country, from GDP growth, from economic growth, to actually safety and security on the global stage and domestically here at home. 100,000 people dying each year of fentanyl flowing across our southern border. That's 50 times the number of people that died on 9-11 dying every year as the person sitting in the White House pretends like he's a passive bystander. So I think Americans are ready for change. I'm surprised, frankly, that number is as high as 33 percent. You take a look at the economic situation in this country, the violence in the streets of cities. You take a look at the fentanyl crisis and our weakened standing on the global stage. Look, I think that that is an occasion for new leadership, regardless of what party you're in. That's part of why I'm in this race, though. I don't think Republicans are going to succeed just through grievance and vengeance. I think we're going to have to lead based on first principles. Yes, I believe in putting America first. But we're at a moment where to put America first, we need to rediscover what America is. And I hope that in my candidacy, both not just for the Republican nomination, but for the general election, bringing independents and even some of those orphaned Democrats along with us, we can revive that shared American national identity mm -hmm. and really put a professional politician like Joe Biden out of the White House to somebody who's a true outsider and understands how to reform the federal government. Vivek, I think there's a lot of people who are resonating uh, uh, and growing towards you and your campaign because you have passion and you believe in what you're talking about and you're a fighter. One of the problems we have is with Donald Trump's indictment, you look around and say, where are the Republicans? Where are the Republicans standing up and pushing back? If this was a Democrat, Vivek, you would have every Democrat leader calling Congress back into session. There would be floor speeches. People would be losing their minds. And Mitch McConnell hasn't said one word about the indictment of Donald Trump. It's outrageous that we don't have more fighters in the Republican Party like you. Bingo. Look, I think this fight against the administrative police state and its corruption shouldn't even be a partisan issue. I would want I to see some people on the left with principle yes. rising up. But if the people on the left aren't doing it, at, where are the Republicans? That is the question. And that is why I feel such a sense of obligation. Look, I'm running against Trump because I believe I can take the America first agenda further than Donald Trump did, including shutting down this administrative police state. Because the sad part is we are where we are. And the irony is Trump himself is now personally the victim of it. So I'm not I'm not just one to complain about the problem. I want to actually go further than Trump did and deliver solutions. But I want to hear other Republicans step up and say that. And that's part of why I've been going to great lengths to be so vocal about it, despite being Wait, his competitor. Are you going to be on the debate stage, debate stages, period? Has Ronna said yes to you? I think it, 
Well, I think at this point, our own numbers are doing great enough that I'm confident about that. We actually crossed 15,000 unique donors within wow. five weeks. So that's actually blowing it out of the water. I still think it'd be a great idea to, for everybody to understand where they're going. After I called on them, the Republican Party did get back to me. The chairman of the debates committee is going to meet me later this month. We're going to sit down. I believe he's sitting down with all of the other major campaigns and getting input. So I expect to get transparency then. We're trying to be fair players here and not just calling them out for the sake of calling them out. For my case, I think we're secure as far as we feel in the rate we're on with unique donors. But I think we deserve clarity as well on even debate stage placement, all the rules. My view is the Democrats can be the party of non-transparency. We in the Republican Party should lead the way with transparency at every step of the process, just like we will when we govern. That's the principle I want to see. The voters will be better served having you on the debate stage. Yep. Thank you for joining us. Always Thank smart. You. Appreciate it. All right, as migrants continue to flow across our southern border, everyday people are